So, just in case you're wondering, I know Brad said last week uh, about my attire, these are the skinniest jeans that I have. And so, uh, I did, he did announce that I'd be wearing skinny jeans today, and so I went in my closet, these are the skinniest ones I had. I did want to see, uh, some of our leaders said, you know what, Brian, we're really going to be able to see the power of your influence next Sunday by seeing how many men come to church with sweater vests on. And so did, and I say that, and Dr. Hill didn't even wear a sweater vest today. And so I think he's leaving me all by myself. And so uh, anyways, uh, just some fun. I'm glad you're here today. Just to remind you that at the conclusion of the service, our, our youth are having a hot dog cookout, and all of the proceeds will go towards our youth and uh, taking them to camp at some point this summer. And so I don't know whether you have any lunch plans. I would encourage you to, uh, to eat here. I think it's a hot dog, a bag of chips, and a soda for five bucks. And so where can you eat for that price? And so I would encourage you to stay. Well, I got to confess, um, I'm a little bit nervous about today's topic, and I would admit that I am immensely unqualified to speak on today's topic. As a matter of fact, um, some might say that I am more qualified to speak on any other topic other than today's topic. I probably would be more qualified to speak on auto mechanic. Uh, auto mechanics or crocheting or underwater basket weaving or something like that than I am the topic that I'm addressing today. I was thinking of all the compliments that I have received in 30 some years of ministry and all the compliments that I have received in my life, I don't think anyone has ever complimented, complimented me for my humility. I don't think anybody has ever said, Brian, you were an extremely humble person. That doesn't surprise me. My mom used to say when we were growing up, she would say this, we don't have a problem with pride in our family because Brian has it all. And so uh, I guess I am probably known in the Burkholder family for being one of the most prideful people or maybe one of the less humble people in our family. It's interesting, I knew I was going to speak on this topic for the last couple of weeks and we've been praying about it. And as a pastor, you wanna put into practice what you're going to speak about. And so I started the week thinking, I'm gonna be extremely humble this week. And so this week, I'm going to demonstrate humility, and I was, I was shocked in and of myself how much I fought pride this week. Someone would say something to me, or someone would say something about me or our ministry, and it's like the hairs would stand up on the back of my neck, and I would want to pounce on them, and uh, I did that a couple of times, and I was reminded, boy, you know what, Brian, you're, you're not demonstrating humility, you're demonstrating uh, pride. And so I want you to know today as, as we dive into our message and as we dive into this passage that I'm not speaking out of strength today. I'm speaking out of weakness. I'm not speaking to you as a teacher today. I'm speaking to you as a student. And I would, I would share with you that I desperately need today's message. I would also say that I'm not alone. <laughs> Because I would say that the majority of us here, probably all of us, struggle with this, this concept of pride, and on the other end, struggle with the concept of humility. When you think about it, that's, that's really where sin originates from, is it not? When, when Satan was cast out of heaven and he committed the very first sin, it was the sin of what? It was the sin of pride. He wasn't satisfied with his position, and he said, I will elevate myself to the place of God. The, there in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned, uh, we know that they took of the forbidden fruit and they disobeyed God, but at the end of the day, it really was the sin of pride because the serpent looked at them and they offered them that they could be, or offered them the chance to be something better than they were. And so it, it was pride that drove them to sin. And so I would say this today, that all of our sins, or if not all of them, the vast majority of our sins, however they manifest themselves, its root cause, their root cause is pride. And so if I can boldly say today that pride is not just something that Brian struggles with, but pride is something that you struggle with. 
It's something that all of us struggle with. We all desperately need to understand and put humility in practice. So, so as I began to think through this, I, I realized that humility is a difficult concept to define. And so I started by saying, okay, let's go to the dictionary and let's see how humility is defined. And so here's the way Webster's defines humility. The state or the quality of being humble. <laughs> so I thought, well, that doesn't help me at all. That doesn't give me, that doesn't give me any more insight into what humility means. The, the word humility, our English word humility, uh, has its origin in the Latin term humilis, meaning low, meaning lowly. And, and so that's r- really where the, her- the word comes from. And so once again, it's difficult to define, but I, but I would share with you today that as, as difficult as it is to define, it's even harder to live. Someone has called humility the elusive virtue. In other words, it's something that we are always chasing after, but we are never able to fully grasp it. It's like trying to chase a greased pig. Anybody ever try to chase a greased pig? And so, and so yeah, you try to chase this greased pig and all of a sudden you grab it and it what? It slips out of your fingers. I think in a very real sense, humility is the same way. If, and I guess that's a big question, if we're really trying to find it and chase after it, when we finally obtain it and we admit that we have it, then all of a sudden what? We're no longer humble. (laughs) I mean, can you stand up and tell everybody, I want you to know that I finally obtained humility. At that moment, I have lost it. And so uh, I've come to the realization that humility is not something that you and I obtain. It's not something that we uh, grasp or conquer, but it's something that we are constantly throughout our entire life trying to learn and try to put into practice. Tim Keller says this, he said, humility is so shy that if you begin talking about it, it leaves. I love that. C.S. Lewis describing humility says, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. So humility is not me standing up in front of you and saying, man, poor me, I'm not very good at this, and abasing ourself. Humility is just having an honest opinion of who we are. And as we will see at the end of the message, desperately recognizing our need for God. So without a doubt, the best source, the best resource of humility is God's word. And the best representative of humility is none other than Jesus Christ himself. And so would you take your Bibles or your iPhone, your iPad, whatever, and follow along with me. We're in Philippians chapter 2 today. And we're reading a phenomenal portion of Scripture. This is one of those mountaintops of Scripture. If you've never spent uh, any amount of time in this portion of Philippians chapter 2, I would encourage you to do so. Philippians chapter 2, I'm going to start by reading just verses 3 and 4, and then we'll dive into the rest of the passage as we go forward. Paul says this, do nothing from self-ambition or conceit. But in, and there's the word, in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his or her own interests, but also to the interests of others. So would you pray with me today? Let's bow our heads and our heart. While I pray, would you ask the Holy Spirit of God to speak to you? I don't know your life. I don't know what you're struggling with. I don't know how pride is manifested in your life. I don't know any of that, but the Holy Spirit of God does. And so would you ask God to speak to your heart and help to make you pliable as, you, as, you, as we study this passage together? Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for the humility of Jesus. Where would we be today if Jesus hadn't humbled himself demonstrated true meekness, true humility, 
and gave his life as a ransom for us, as we'll see in today's passage. Help us to realize today that our example is Jesus. Help us to realize today that the only way we can demonstrate this concept in our lives is by submitting ourselves to him, by having his mind control our minds, by, by surrendering ourselves to his power. So Lord, I pray that you would teach us from your word today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, so this year our theme is live generously. You're gonna see that all over the building throughout the year. And last week we began to unpack that concept and we began talking about what it means to live generously. We saw that the first step to generous living is unity and we, we fleshed that out. We unpacked that last week. Simply put, we need each other. I need you, you need me, we need each other. We saw that the basis for our unity is not our similarities, because we're different. The basis for our unity is our Savior. Jesus is the basis for our unity. I wanna wanna pause and say something that is really important to our HCC leadership and to me. I'm gonna make a quick comment and move on, but this past week we've heard comments about how people from some countries are less valuable than people from other countries. And I don't wanna make any comments to any of that, but I do wanna talk about what we believe here at Hollywood Community Church. And at HCC, we believe that every person, every single person has been made in the image of God. And that every person, has equal value, regardless of where you were born, regardless of where they live. And today we lock arms with our brothers and sisters in Haiti. We lock arms with our brothers and sisters in West Africa. We lock arms with our brothers and sisters in impoverished nations. And we recognize that we are one in Jesus Christ. That's what Paul talks about. That's what Paul talks about in the passage. In today's passage, Paul moves from unity to humility. And and Paul is speaking to a congregation that was experiencing dissension. Paul was speaking to a congregation there in Philippi that evidently had a lack of unity because Paul spends some time addressing it. And so Paul pleads with them that they become united. And here's what he says in today's passage. He says this, he urges them to strive for unity through humility. And he says that because unity requires humility. In order for us to truly be unified, we have to recognize the value and the importance of one another. And Paul says that really clearly in the passage that we're going to look at today. We must recognize the value and the importance of one another, and we must demonstrate humility one to another and one for another. And so, Paul makes two simple points. It's not profound, even though the text is profound, but the truth that Paul is trying to convey is not profound. And so he does two things. First of all, he exhorts you and I to be humble, and we'll see that in the passage. And then he shows us that Jesus is the one who exemplifies true humility. And so in verses three and four, Paul gives two brief statements Each of these verses um, has a negative command and then a positive command. Now that's important because Paul is showing us that humility not only requires us to stop doing something, it requires us to stop being prideful, to stop demonstrating prideful actions, but humility also requires us to start doing something. And so humility involves a negative command as well as a positive command. So notice with me in verse three, Paul says this. He says, do nothing from self-ambition or conceit. And so there is his his negative exhortation. The phrase self-ambition in verse seven is one word in the original language. It's found seven times in the New Testament. Here's what it conveys. It conveys the idea of a person who who consistently seeks personal advantage, regardless of its effect on others. Now, before you sit back and say, that's not me, 
let me just say, it is you. (laughs) And it is me. And so Paul is saying that we should not do anything that seeks out personal advantage. The second word is the phrase, he says, do nothing from self-ambition or conceit. The word conceit, depending on the translation you might have, it might say empty conceit. Because the word has the idea of pride with no basis for justification. It's like the person who looks in the mirror and thinks they're incredibly handsome or beautiful, and they're not. It's like the person who grabs a microphone and sings and thinks they're extremely talented, and they're not. It's like the person who thinks they have the ability to do something, and they don't. They have what? They have empty pride. Paul talks about that in Galatians chapter 6 because he talks about someone who thinks they are something when they are really nothing. (laughs) Do you know anybody like that? Don't be thinking about me when you say, when you think that, all right? And so here's what Paul says. Paul says, don't do anything for personal advantage. If you're filling out your outline, that's the very first bullet point. Don't do anything for personal advantage. So as I thought through that, And as I prayed through that this week, I was reminded of how often we do things, at times even the right things, for the wrong reasons. And by the way, we can do the right thing, but with the wrong motive. And I was reminded how often I do that and how often we do that. For example, you can help your spouse, you can meet a need that your spouse has, because there is really something that you want your spouse to do for you. And so it's almost like, hey, this is what I'm gonna do, but here's what I expect, tit for tat, quid pro quo, I'm gonna do this for you, but I expect you to do this for me. If that's the way that I'm serving my spouse, I'm doing it with the, right, the wrong attitude. You, you can volunteer for the worship team, but you can do it with the wrong attitude. You can, you can do it to show off your vocal skills or, or maybe even just to practice and get better and all of those things in and of themselves are not wrong attitudes, but they're not the best reason to be serving the Lord and to be serving others. You can help a friend, but only because you desperately need that friend's friend or that, that, that acquaintance's friendship. And so you don't want to lose them. And so you're constantly doing something for them. But in reality, you're doing something for them for you. You're not doing it for them. You're doing it for yourself. Here's what I realized. Much of what we do, although it seems that we are being generous, and we're talking about live generously, Much of what we do, although it seems as if we're being generous, we are actually doing things for our own benefits. But Paul says in the passage, do nothing from self-ambition or conceit. Now, Now, I know I'm speaking to an incredibly intelligent group. What's the word nothing mean? Zero, zilch, nada. Uh, Paul's not saying, okay, listen, do, do some of the things for your own benefit, but just allow a small portion to do it for the benefit of others. Paul says, don't do anything, nada, zilch, nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. I was so convicted about that this week. And so the, as I prayed through that, here's what the Lord told me. Brian, Brian don't preach so that others might think that you're a great preacher or even a good preacher. Brian, don't serve others so they will like you. Brian, don't become a community leader so that you'll have a lot of influence. Man, Brian, don't even come to church in order to make yourself feel better or for personal gain. Paul says this, don't do anything, do nothing for personal advantage. Man, would you just pause for a second? I don't know your life. I don't know what's going on in your life, but how often do you do things and you commend yourself for doing something, but at the end of the day, you're not doing it for that person, for the Lord, for this ministry. You're actually doing it for yourself. And there's personal advantage there. Paul says, do nothing from self-ambition or conceit. Then he makes this phrase, and here's the positive, count others 
as more significant than yourself. The, the word significant is, is an interesting word. It means surpassing. It means rising above. It has the idea of superior. And, and so the idea is that, that I or you, we should count others, we should treat others as if they were superior, they were above, they were better, they were more important, they're more significant than us. And the word count is, uh, is the key word because it's not saying pretend that others are more important than yourself, but the word count has the idea of really, genuinely, in your heart, believing that other people have more value than you. So here's the next thing that I wrote in my notes, recognize others as more important than yourself. Paul continues to flesh that out in verse five because he says this, look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. So, so here's what Paul is saying very simply. It's not profound. It's not deep. You can grasp this. Paul is saying instead of focusing on your own wants, instead of focusing on your own needs, focus on providing and caring for the wants and the needs of your brothers and sisters in Christ, of your brothers and sisters in this congregation. He's talking to a church He's talking to our church. He says, find ways to serve those around you. Just this last week's message, this is countercultural. Let me say this, it is counter-Christian cultural because we live in a day and age, and, and I hope I'm not, well, maybe I do, I hope I'm stepping on toes, but we live in a day and age in which we go to the church to get what we want. We go to church to experience the worship style that we want. We go to church to hear what we want to hear. We go to church to see what we want to see. We go to church to experience what we want to experience. And here's what Paul is saying. He's saying to a church just like ours, to the church of Philippi, he's saying that concept is entirely wrong. You don't go to church for what you want. You go to church to take care of one another. That's exactly what Paul is saying in the passage. As a family, our responsibility is to take care of one another. Think with me today. This is, this is so fair, but very practical. Imagine how little you would have to worry about your own wants and your own needs if you knew that there were 500 other people that were taking care of your wants and your needs. If you knew that there was a family to whom you belonged that would be there for you when you needed it, that would pray for you when you were discouraged, that would uplift you when you were down, that would provide for your needs, physical or emotional or whatever they were, whenever you needed them, you wouldn't have to worry about yourself because there'd be hundreds of other people that would do that. And all you had to do was worry about taking care of one another. That, my friends, is what a faith family is all about. The writer of Hebrews says it this way in Hebrews 10, 25, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but here's what he says, encouraging one another. And so the writer of Hebrews is saying, man, when you come to church, man, do that on a regular basis, and even more so when you see the day approaching, but come with the idea that I'm going to look for someone to encourage. I'm going to look for someone to uplift. I'm going to look for someone to whom I can minister. Paul exhorts us to humility, and humility is not a low concept of ourself. It's realizing that everybody else is more important than me. And so I'm gonna recognize who I am in the eyes of God, and I'm gonna look for opportunities to minister to others. I'm even gonna self-sacrifice for the benefit of others. History is filled with, with people who have lived 
this lifestyle, and you can Google it, all kinds of people who have lived this kind of lifestyle. Let me give you a, a couple of illustrations. Richard Rescorla was instrumental in the evacuations of thousands of people during the 9-11 attacks there in the Twin Towers in New York City. He was director of security for Morgan Stanley. Uh, Rescorla was a, was a stickler for building safety, and, and they say that twice a year he had evacuation pro, uh, uh, um, practices for everybody in Morgan Stanley in the Twin Towers. When the attack happened, Richard Rescorla put his plan into action and calmly instructed people how to leave, how they had practiced. Right in, up until the moment that Richard was killed and lost his own life, he was directing others, he was helping others. They said that because of his heroic actions, he saved the lives of 2,500 people. Selfless actions. Ryan Arnold, next picture. Ryan's the guy on my right, on your left. Ryan Arnold's brother, Chad, on your, on your right, desperately needed a liver transplant. Without even thinking, without hesitating, Ryan's first question is, I wonder if my liver is compatible. And he found out that his liver was compatible. And so without hesitation, he offered to donate a portion of his liver to his brother. As with all surgeries, there was a risk. And in the midst of his surgery, Ryan, who had young kids, lost his life. He made the ultimate sacrifice to ensure that his brother could live. <laughs> Thinking of someone else other than himself. Lieutenants George Fox, Alexander Goo, Jordan Washington, and Clark Poling were chaplains of varying faith stationed aboard the food transport or the transport ship, the Dorchester. When the ship was struck by a submarine's torpedo, the chaplains began passing out life vests, directing people to safety. And when all the life jackets ran out, these four guys took their own life jackets off and gave their life jackets to others. And as the ship sunk, they locked arms and they sang and they lost their lives together. Those are tremendous stories of people who made great sacrifices for the benefit of others. None, though, compare with the illustration that's given in our passage. So would you look back in your Bibles with me today? And so we've seen Paul's exhortation in verses 3 and 4. In verse 5, Paul moves from exhortation to illustration. And he gives us the illustration of Jesus Christ. Notice verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. The, the phrase, have this mind, actually means belief that is lived out in action. And so Paul is encouraging us, he tells us to be humble, and then he looks at us and says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to have the same mind, the same attitude, the same response as Jesus Christ. Keep reading with me in verse 6. He says, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped. Let me pause there for a second because the word form is an interesting word. It means the very substance or the very essence. It has the idea of an exact image. So, so here's what Paul says about Jesus, who being in the form of God, he's not saying that Jesus was like God. He's not saying that Jesus was similar to God. He's saying that Jesus had the exact same essence as God, the exact image as God. L let me illustrate. So most of you know that I have a, a twin brother. I think we'll put a picture of my twin brother, Bruce, up on the screen. I have a twin brother. In a lot of ways, we're alike. Do we have that picture? I hope we have that picture. There we go. The, that's a picture of my twin brother, Bruce. Bruce might walk in and you might think, oh my word, there's Brian. Or, you know, Brian's lost about 15 pounds or something like that. <laughs> Bruce, they were actually watching Amber when we went to Wisconsin a few months ago and Bruce was walking through our neighborhood and Ernie, one of my neighbors at the end of the street, calls Bruce over and he says, 
man, have you lost weight? You've lost about 15 or 20 pounds. And Bruce is like, no, 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 I'm not Brian, I'm Bruce, all right? If Bruce would walk in today, you would see that there's unbelievable similarities between Bruce and I. We're, we're similar, but we're not the exact image. Most of you know my oldest son, Justin. Justin, in a lot of ways, is, is just like me. His actions, all of that is like me, but Justin and I are not the exact image. We're different in a lot of ways. The text says, though, that Jesus is the exact image of the Father. That's what the text says, who being in the form of God, he did not count equality with God as something to be grasped. The, the Greek structure of that phrase is so very interesting. He, he did not count equality with God as a thing to be held, catch this, for his own personal advantage. You see the way Paul is laying out the argument? Paul tells us, don't do anything for your own personal advantage. And then he says, let me give the illustration of Jesus, who was God in the flesh, yet he did not allow his godness to be used for his own personal advantage. You and I can only begin to imagine how Jesus could have used his godness for his own advantage. I mean, he could have sat there and said, okay, I'm hungry. I want, you know, you know, Rocky Road ice cream. Boom, and there it was. Or this person's bothering me. Zap, send him straight to hell. I mean, he could have done any of that. I mean, I, I mean quite frankly, he could have. But here's what the text says. He did not use his godness to his own advantage. Even though he had the very essence of God, he was God, he didn't use that for his own personal benefit. But notice the text says, but he emptied himself. That word is such a powerful word. It's the Greek word canoe. It's the idea we get, if you you, you know anything about theology, it's what we get our kenosis theory from. Here's what it means. It means that he emptied himself He voluntarily deprived himself of his divine rights and his divine responsibilities. So so Jesus didn't come to earth with a better than us mentality. He didn't come to earth saying, man, this is the way I'm used to be treated up in heaven. I hope this is the way you're gonna treat me here. He came to earth and he completely emptied himself of all of his rights. Please understand what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that he gave up his godness. It doesn't mean that he stopped being God. He was always 100% God. He didn't even give up his divine attributes, but rather he chose to not use them for his advantage. So what did he do? He emptied himself and took upon the form of a servant. It's not always clear in in our English Bibles, but the word form of God, we already talked about what that means, the exact image. Paul uses the exact same word talking about Jesus becoming a servant. So, So Jesus was, is, always will be God in everything that that word means, in all of its essence. He was in the form of God but he emptied himself, and here's what Jesus became. He didn't become like a servant. He didn't pretend he was a servant. It wasn't like he was a servant from nine to five, and when he went home tonight, all of a sudden it's like, oh, great, I get to take off my servanthood, and I get to be God for 12 hours until I go back out and have to be man again. No, he took upon himself the form, exact same word, the exact image of servanthood. He didn't pretend to be a servant. He became a servant. God incarnate in all of his perfection, in all of his power, became a slave, a servant, fulfilled every single nuance of that word. He took the form of a servant. Here's what I wrote down in my notes, and I know we've taken a little bit of time. Here's what I wrote down in my notes. Humility is radical. That's radical, is it not? 
I mean, to give up everything you are, all of the rights that you possess, that is extremely radical. And yet the humility that God calls us to is not something simple, it's not something easy, it's not something that we can put on one moment and take off another moment, it's not something that I do from nine to five, it's not something that I do when I put on my preacher's hat, but when I'm at home, I'm different. Humility is radical. It's not just a subtle shift in our thinking or a slight adjustment to our lifestyle. It is the complete remaking of who we are. Godly humility is radically radical. Godly humility is so life-changing, so attitude-changing, so, so lifestyle-changing that we become something contrary to, her, to who or what we were before. Paul says, have this mindset in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Keep reading with me. In verse 8, Paul fleshes that out. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Here's the next thing I wrote in, in, in your notes is, humility is the result of obedience. Humility is the result of obedience. Here's what I want you to catch, and it's hard for us to understand because we have at times these erroneous concepts of what took place in the incarnation. But here's exactly what Paul is telling us, that Jesus wasn't the one calling the shots. Jesus wasn't the one making the decisions. He wasn't the one doing all of the miraculous signs during his life. Did he have the power to do it? Absolutely. Could he have done it? Absolutely. Was he still omniscient? Absolutely. Was he still omnipotent? Absolutely. He could have been calling all of those shots, making all of those decisions, performing all of those miracles. But Jesus decided to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit of God and to rely on the direction of the Father. He was submissive in everything he did. Don't misunderstand, he was fully God, he was fully capable of everything himself. But in humility, he submitted himself to the Father. And he did that to the point of death. And Paul, Paul emphasizes, he says, to the point of death, even the death on the cross. The church of Philippi would have understood that so much better than you and I. They lived in a Roman culture. They would have understood the humiliation of the crucifixion. Victims were humiliated in every single way while they were being mutilated and while they were being killed. Jesus suffered that miserable punishment in humble obedience to the Father and in humble submission to the will of God. You see, that word obedience has the idea of doing the will of another. Remember what Jesus said when he was there in Gethsemane? Right before he went to the cross, he said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But he made this statement, but not what I will, but your will be done. He completely submitted himself and was obedient to the plan the Father. Let me just pause for a second and say that, my friends, is the gospel. And you would sit back and I would sit back and say, Brian, from a human point of view, it makes no sense whatsoever. Why would God humble himself so much? Why would God, the all-powerful one, lay aside all of his attributes? Why would he allow himself to be mutilated and killed and, hu and humbled in such a way? And there's only one answer. The only answer is you and me. And the only answer was that he realized that in our sinful condition, we could not save ourselves. And he did what was absolutely necessary for us to have life and to have it more abundantly. Keep reading with me in verse 9. As Paul continues, he says, therefore, 
understanding everything that Jesus has gone through. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him, given to him a name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Because of Jesus' obedience on the cross, the Father exalted him. I, and I want, you to, I want you to understand this. There's some deep theological truth here. That doesn't mean that after his resurrection, Jesus was elevated to God's status. Doesn't mean that he didn't have all of that beforehand. And because he did that, God looks at him and says, man, you know what? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a promotion. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm going to give you a promotion. There's probably going to be a pay raise with that. I'm going, to, I'm going to elevate you. No, that's not what the passage means. He was always an equal part of the Trinity. But, but here's what the text means. His true glory was now revealed to all of creation. So much so, Paul says, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. One day, believers, as believers, we will kneel before Jesus Christ and we will recognize him as King of kings and Lord of lords. But not only will we do that, but every unbeliever, every person who has denied the existence of God, every person who has lifted their hands and their voices and cursed God and cursed Jesus Christ and has doubted his existence, Paul says that every single person will kneel before him and recognize him as Lord of lords. His true glory is revealed, and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. So, so here's what Paul is saying. Humility results in blessing. Humility results in in blessing. Now, now, now listen, please understand what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that, oh my word, when you and I demonstrate humility that we will be raised to Jesus-like status. That certainly is not what I'm saying. But the scripture does tell us that just as Jesus was exalted because of his humility, when you and I demonstrate humility, that likewise we will be exalted. Let me give you just a couple of verses. Matthew 23, 12. Whosoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Kind of see the paradox in all of that? So as we think, man, you know what? I, if I could exalt myself, I gotta let people know what my talents and my skills are. I gotta promote myself. I gotta do all of that. Forget this humility thing. I've gotta make it happen. And the text says, he who exalts himself will be humbled. And, and in, in contrast, he who humbles himself will be exalted. James chapter 4 and verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. 1 Peter 5, 6, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. So, here's what Paul's saying. God wants us to live generously. As a congregation, we should demonstrate that generous living. It begins with unity. It begins by recognizing that all of us are the same value and we lock arms and, and we're unified, not because we're similar, we're unified because of Jesus Christ. And that unity requires humility. And so humility, as I mentioned, is not something that comes natural. And so can I give you just a couple of practical ways for us to kind of chase that grease pig <laughs> All right, to kind of chase that, that thing that's difficult for us to grasp. Let me give you a couple of practical things today. Number one, check your motives. Check your motives. And, and this is so very important. God not only sees what you're doing, but God knows why you are doing it. Do, do, do you catch that? God not only sees that you're here at church today, but God knows why you're here at church today. God not only sees your actions, but God sees your intents. He not only sees the outside, but he sees the inside. And I would go so far as to say that God is much more concerned with your and my motives than he is with our 
actions. Remember what he said when he chose, uh, uh, was it Saul to be king? He said, man, man looks on the outward, was it Saul or David? I, I forget, I apologize, somebody correct me afterward. But he said, he said, man looks on the outward appearance, but God what? God looks on the hearts. So today, God is looking at your hearts. He knows what your motives are. Regularly examine your motives to make sure that you are not doing anything out of selfish ambition. Here, here's the second thing. It's even more difficult. Kill your ego. Kill your ego. Paul said it this way. He said, I die daily. What did he mean by that? Obviously, he didn't mean that he self-sacrificed himself. When he said, I die daily, he, he's talking about dying to his selfish desires, dying to his pride, dying to his ego. Listen, that ought to be a part of your regular prayer life. As you wake up in the morning, you ought to sit back and say, okay, God, you realize I struggle with this and this and this. Help me today. Uh, help me to crucify those actions today. And may Jesus Christ live through me. May Vicky not see Brian May Vicky see Jesus through Brian. May the people I work with not say, man, what's the deal with Brian today? He's demonstrating this defensiveness, this pride. May they not see that. May they see Jesus Christ through me. And it's not something that I do. It's something that Jesus does through me. So every day, kill your ego. Make it a part. Make an altar in your bedroom. Make an altar at your home and sacrifice your ego every single day. Here's the third thing that goes right along with it. Surrender to the truth of the gospel. Surrender to the truth of the gospel. So here's the, sometimes, and I'm, I know my time's up, so, so sometimes we have an idea that the gospel only has to do with our salvation. So, so many years ago, I believed the gospel. I confessed my sin and I asked Jesus to come into my heart. Praise the Lord for the gospel, but that's not what I need now. Here's what I'm learning. I need the gospel every single day. I need the truth of the gospel every single day in my life. So every day I wake up and I realize that I'm a sinner. Thank God I'm a sinner saved by grace. But I don't have the strength nor do I have the power to do and be what God wants me to do. But I'm thankful that in Jesus I have everything I need. That's why Paul says, have this mind in you which is in Christ Jesus. So you and I today as followers of Jesus Christ, we have everything we need. We have all the power we need to overcome temptation. We have all the power that we need to treat our spouse correctly. We have all the power that we need to have patience with our kids. We have all the power that we need to put up with with an, an ungrateful employee or an ungrateful employer. We have everything we need in Jesus. And so every day I wake up and I surrender to the truth of the gospel. Paul says that in chapter one of Philippians. He said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Surrender to the truth of the gospel. Here's the last thing, elevate others. Elevate others. Look for ways to elevate others. Others. Naturally, we have a tendency to want to elevate ourselves. We manipulate the conversation so that we can tell something funny about ourselves. Do we not? I, I mean, you ever been that way? I do it all the time. I'm in this conversation, I think, ooh, if I told them that story, that would be really funny. So, how can I move the congregation, the conversation around so I can talk about that? And so, and so we're constantly looking for ways to elevate ourselves. Look to elevate others. Was it John the Baptist that said, He must increase? but I must decrease. So how do we apply this? We apply this realizing that we are part of a faith family, a faith family that is filled with so many wants and hurts and needs and struggles and addictions and sins. We realize that. And I sit back and say, okay, God, I wanna be a positive part of this family. God, help me to humble myself and help me to be a blessing to others. That's what generous living is all about. It's not about me. It's about Jesus first, others second, and myself last.